great pleasure to welcome Dr. Caldwell Esselson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, General. <laughs> well, I can't tell you how exciting it is. I've been in Cleveland now for, since 1957. And I'm almost embarrassed to say this is my first trip to the center of Medina. <laughs> but we had an absolutely wonderful uh, meal. We got a lot ahead of us tonight, and I promised everybody we'd get you out here by midnight, so we've got a lot of, <laughs> a lot of work to do. Uh, you know, the truth be known, coronary artery heart disease is nothing more than a toothless paper tiger that need never, ever exist. And if it does exist, it need never, ever progress. What I'm so excited about with this community tonight is uh, one of, uh, somebody who is one of my poster children, Pat Baraducci, <laughs> has been trying to uh, save all and protect all of you while he's been police chief. Now he's going a step beyond that. And we're really going to try to protect you from, from being sick. That is very exciting and very noble, and Ann and I were delighted to be asked to uh, be with you this evening. Uh, just for a little bit of background, I think it's important first that we, uh, we look at the fact that suppose that you're a heart surgeon and you decide you're going to hang out your shingle in the Papua Highlands in New Guinea. How about rural China? Maybe Central Africa? The Tarahumara Indians in northern Mexico? Forget it. You better plan on selling pencils. Heart disease is virtually non-existent in those cultures because by heritage and tradition, what? They're basically plant-based. They're not eating any of the building blocks for heart disease. On the other hand, when I took this photograph when I was leaving Vietnam in 1968, it's quite st striking when you think about the fact that when we did the autopsy studies on GIs who died in Korea and died in Vietnam, at an average age of 20, 80% of these young GIs already had gross evidence of coronary artery disease that you could see without a microscope. But when you autopsied the Koreans and the Vietnamese, it wasn't 80%. It was 1% or 3%. So we're doing something maybe that's not right. So that was repeated. And that study, 40 years later, this time it was done in this country, looking at young women and young men between the ages of 17 and 34 who had died of accidents, homicides, and suicides. And what they found was that the disease is now ubiquitous. Everybody had early coronary disease. Now, anybody here in the audience tonight over 17? It's always I find so much more engaging when you're talking with patients. <laughs> now, <clears throat> on the other hand, about four years ago, when I was in Los Angeles and I was moderating a panel, one of the panel members was Dr. Lou Culler. Now, Lou Culler is the professor of public health at the Pittsburgh School of Medicine. Uh, and on that day, in Los Angeles on that panel, Lou Keller made the following statement. All males who are 65 and all females who are 70 who have been exposed to the traditional Western diet have cardiovascular disease and should be treated as such. Well, what is that telling us? Is it our genes? Is it, or is it perhaps the way of life? So we really had a chance to understand this. In World War II, in World War II, you may recall, well, no, I'm not going to say you recall, <laughs> but what happened was when Germany overran the low countries of Holland and Belgium, and they occupied Denmark and Norway, 
It was characteristic that the Axis powers of Germany would take away their livestock, their cattle, their sheep, their goats, their pigs, their chickens, their turkeys, gone for their troops. So now suddenly, these populations were plant-based. And in 1951, doctors Strom and Janssen, in England's leading medical journal, The Lancet, reported what happened in Norway to the death rate from heart attack and stroke during those war years, and it's very interesting. Let's look at that together. Here we see 1927, heart attack and stroke, Norway, going up, 1930, going up, 1935, going up, 1939, whoop, 1940, 41, 42, 3, 4, 5. Who knew that the Germans were the greatest public health educators in all of Europe? <laughs> What's going on? And yet, look, as soon as we had cessation of hostilities, back comes the meat, back comes the dairy, back comes the strokes, back come the heart attacks. All right, now you've had the easy part. Now you're going to have to really put on your thinking hat because we're going to get into some new vocabulary for a minute. This artery on the right all of you who say that this is diseased, go to the head of the class. Yes, 90% blocked, and you might say, well, when that finally blocks, that person's going to have a heart attack. Well, not quite. That actually only accounts for about 10% of heart attacks. It's going to give that patient a lot of symptoms, maybe a lot of chest pain, some shortness of breath, kind of feel crummy. But probably this old plaque or this old blockage is not going to give you anything else except grief, but not a heart attack. Now, to get to the heart attack, let's look at this normal. And let's talk about where, what all experts agree upon. And I think that this is probably the most important next three or four slides of the entire evening. Because these, this tiny little layer, this little, even I know those of you in the back can even see that right on the inside, there's a tiny little single layer of, of these cells. And this is an absolute magic carpet. This has a name. This carpet is called the endothelium. The endothelium lines the inside of all of our arteries. And all experts agree that this is where we have the inception of heart disease. How does that happen? Well, when you're first eating this typical Western diet, you're having milkshakes and pizza and hamburgers, certain cellular elements in your circulation get sticky. That's the first thing that happens. Things get sticky. And what gets sticky are your, actually your endothelial cells and your platelets, your clotting factor, and your bad LDL cholesterol gets sticky. All right, what happens? When it gets sticky, your bad cholesterol rides up against the sticky endothelium, and now it migrates. So your bad LDL cholesterol has now migrated into the subendothelial layer, where it's not supposed to be, and there it gets turned into this absolute cauldron of inflammation. What is inflammation? That's a funny word. Inflammation is a, a lot of white cells in that subendothelial space that get filled all right, with these bad cholesterol molecules, and that ends up making such a fury of enzymes that eventually what happens is that all that inflammation leads, to, here's your plaque, this blister of inflammation that's forming because it's food-based. The bad food you're eating make these free radicals that cause that inflammation. And what happens is the products of inflammation thin out this cap over the plaque, thin out, thinner and thinner and thinner until it gets as thin as a cobweb in some places. And then someday, the sheer force of blood racing over that cobweb tears it. And now you have ruptured your plaque. And this is how 90% of heart attacks occur. Once you have ruptured your plaque, you're now spilling 
plaque content out into the flowing blood, which activates platelets, your clotting factor, and in a matter of minutes after you've ruptured your plaque, you suddenly begin to get this clot forming at the place of rupture. And that is in and of itself self-propagating. So in a matter of minutes, we get over to here. This whole artery, which was only partially blocked, 30, 40, 50 percent, you don't begin to get symptoms till you're over 70 percent blocked. So here's this artery that before gave no symptoms. Now in a matter of minutes, it's all totally blocked. All the downstream heart muscle is being deprived of oxygen and nutrients. And that part of your heart muscle is dying, and that's a heart attack. And the classic example of this that many have seen in recent years was that beloved TV journalist who used to do Sunday morning Meet the Press, Timothy Russert. And when he was working Saturday afternoon to prepare his Sunday program, he ruptured his plaque, had a heart attack, and sadly the, the medics could not uh, resuscitate him from a fatal cardiac arrhythmia. But when you think about it, the tremendous good news that you can see in this sequence of events, all you have to do when you think about it, let's just reverse this a little bit. If I can convince you this evening that you can absolutely change so that never has to occur. That sequence of events where you rupture that plaque that, that all of you have, all you have to do is eat in a way that you strengthen the cap over the plaque. You're not weakening it, you strengthen it. And how do you strengthen it? By changing what you eat. And we'll talk about that in a few moments. But So that may look like the bad news, sure. But it also explains the good news. All you have to do, eat in a way that you never get those cellular elements to be sticky. Eat in a way that you can absolutely strengthen your cap. When you strengthen the cap over your plaque, you have made yourself heart attack proof. Bulletproof, heart attack proof. How exciting is that? Especially how exciting is that for somebody who's already had a heart attack, right? Yes, for years, this was a cartoon in my, in my presentation. Halfway through his hearty man breakfast, Dwayne felt he heard several of his small arteries slamming shut. Now, no longer a cartoon, because you've got to think again. Here are the endothelial cells, and this is obviously an artery that, again, is partially blocked. And what I want to talk about is why those endothelial cells are so magical. Because what do they produce that makes magic? All of us, every one of you in the audience right now is making something, a magic molecule that your endothelial cells are producing. It has a name, nitric oxide. It's a gas discovered in 1988. Three men, Drs. Fershgott, Murad, and Louis Ignaro, they all got the Nobel Prize, 1998. It's nitric oxide that a healthy endothelium is making. All right, what is the function? of nitric oxide. Nitric oxide keeps your cellular elements in your blood flowing smoothly so it can't stick. Nitric oxide is the strongest vasodilator in the body. When you climb stairs, the arteries to your heart dilate. The arteries to your legs dilate. All right? Nitric oxide also inhibits inflammation from forming in the wall of the artery. Protects you from getting hypertension, high blood pressure. And most importantly, nitric oxide protects you from making these plaque or blockages. So obviously you want lots of nitric oxide. Well, how much nitric oxide do you suppose is left in our high school seniors? Not enough to protect them from graduating with a diploma and with coronary artery heart disease. Not good, right? And that really is what, to me, is such an inspiring and exciting thing to think that if we can finally ever get others to recognize this and change the school menus, and then once we change the school menus and the kids get it right, the kids teach the parents. And then they get it right at home. 
because it's utter nonsense to spend billions of dollars treating this benign foodborne illness. And it's great. If you want to just live to the warranty period, the American diet is great. Takes you up to 2025, no problems. <laughs> but some of us feel there's, there's life beyond that. Uh, now, so at this point, how do you test your nitric oxide? All right? You want to know, God, I've heard all about this. Dr. Esselstyn has talked about this nitric oxide. How do I know I've got nitric oxide? Well, there is a little research tool that I'll explain for a minute, but that doesn't have to be a concern of yours if you're eating correctly. First of all, here's the test. The nitric, this is what's done on a research basis. Pretty easy. This is called the brachial artery tourniquet test. And what you do is you take an ultrasound probe, place it over your brachial artery with the elbow. Then you encircle your upper arm with a blood pressure cuff, inflate it above systolic blood pressure, so that for five minutes you have zero blood flow to your forearm. Now, I've had that done. It's not exactly habit forming. But <laughs> And you release the cuff and remeasure the new diameter of the brachial artery just after you release the cuff. And in the normal person, it'll go 30% wider. Now, there was a wonderful cardiologist in Baltimore by the name of Robert Vogel. And what Vogel did next was brilliant. He took a group of healthy young subjects to a certain fast food restaurant that is characterized by arches, which are golden. <laughs> One half of the group got the cornflakes, their brachial artery tourniquet test, <laughs> normal. The other half got the hash browns and sausages. Within 120 mon minutes, these healthy young subjects who'd had the hash browns and sausages <laughs> couldn't dilate the artery. That single meal had so savaged, had so injured, had so compromised the capacity of those endothelial cells to make nitric oxide that these young subjects could not dilate. However, if you follow them along into the early evening, kind of began to recover, right? However, you and I know the next morning, for breakfast, scrambled eggs and bacon. Lunchtime, white bread with cold cuts and mayonnaise. And at supper, how about a baked potato with some sour cream, lamb chops, vegetables soaked in butter, ranch dressing on a salad, and ice cream. We just, here in America, we just take those good old endothelial cells and we just hammer them and we beat on them. And we got coronary disease by the time we're 17. Not enough for a cardiac event. But the foundation is there. How ridiculous is that? Yeah. My dad had his first heart attack at 43. Uh, this is simply a little measure. On the left, flow-mediated dilatation. That means that how effective is this meal for producing or allowing vasodilatation. The worst is down here at 7. The best is 10. So you can see that the worst of all is the Atkins diet, right? All that lovely meat, high protein and fat. Baseline, South Beach a little better. There's your champ, plant-based nutrition. All right. Now here's the new kid on the block. I'm throwing an awful lot at you in just a few more moments of this tough stuff. But why do I mention the endothelial cell? Because right now, and you have to know right up front, many of my good friends are cardiologists and cardiac surgeons. But today, the reason we're not doing so well, as far as I'm concerned, is that cardiovascular medicine is wonderful at treating symptoms. We got all kinds of drugs, procedures like stents and bypasses for treating symptoms. But there's no treatment of the causation of the disease. And I'll tell you why. Because People in cardiovascular medicine do not think that patients will change their behavior. 
And I, on the other hand, totally disagree with that, and I feel very strongly that it's not the message that is wrong. It's how the message is given. And we'll talk about, a little bit more about that in a moment. But the endothelial progenitor cell comes from your bone marrow, and it replaces your senescent, injured, worn out endothelial cells. It's the backup, all right? Now, if you were to measure the blood level of endothelial progenitor cells in somebody who is obese, is a smoker, has high cholesterol, is diabetic, and has high blood pressure, their endothelial progenitor cells are gonna be <clears throat> low. On the other hand, you measure somebody else who's just the reverse of that, lean, low cholesterol, not diabetic, not hypertensive, not a smoker, they're gonna be higher. But that's not enough for me because these are so valuable <clears throat> that I'm greedy and I wanna have these really sparkle in you. How do I get those to sparkle? Do I give you a drug or a pill or a shot? No, I give you the right food. How do we learn about this? We learned about this through a study that was done with the healthiest human being on the planet, an Okinawan woman between the ages of 17 and 34. Half of them got the standard Okinawan diet. The other half got a standard Okinawan diet plus five additional green leafy vegetables daily. At the end of the study, when they measured the blood level of circulating endothelial cells, they were strikingly higher than those who've been having the green leafy vegetables regularly. So I think you can already look a little bit ahead until we get to treatment and know what I'm gonna say about that. Now, uh, this is your HDL. This is your good cholesterol. And you've heard a lot about this, and I'm going to just try to upset a lot about what you've heard. For years, we thought that it was important to have a high good cholesterol. Well, the wheels were sort of coming off that a little bit. When we noticed almost over 20 years ago, that many of our patients who were eating plant-based, their HDL, their good cholesterol fell at the same time that they were losing weight, at the same time that their symptoms were going away, and at the same time that they were reversing their disease. And the job of your HDL cholesterol is, is what we call efflux which is a fancy word for reverse cholesterol transport, taking the cholesterol where it shouldn't be, back to the liver to get it neutralized. All right? Now, the other thing that happened, which is of interest, was that in 2006, Pfizer was going to invent the pill that forever would end heart disease. And they put it through several trials. Uh, it was made up of Lipitor, which drops your bad LDL cholesterol low, and Torcetrabib, which drove your HDL right through the roof, over 100. They were just about to release this on the public when the chairman of Pfizer got a call from the chairman of the Independent Monitoring Committee. Mr. Pfizer chairman, sir, we have a problem. All right, what's the problem? Well, we looked at the control group there have been 51 deaths. But however, with the placebo, with the torcetrabib group, there have been 81 deaths. It was killing people. So now, recently, there's been a wonderful study that I'm gonna share with you, and this came out this January. It begins to explain, I think, one of the reasons why we were doing so well with our patients, and that is that if you took, as they did, 2,000 patients, and they measure the level, blood level of the HDL, the measured level had zero to do with its capacity to efflux. In other words, to do its job, you didn't have to have it be high. And also, the very month after that, there was wonderful research that came out of uh, UCLA. What they did here, they measured inside the HDL molecule is a key protein, ApoA1, and ApoA1 can be very easily injured by an inflammatory, typical American Western diet. And when you injure 
that delicate APOA1 inside your HDL, it makes your HDL not only unable to work for you, it now is no longer an anti-inflammatory, it turns into a pro-inflammatory joining with your LDL to injure you. Pretty exciting to think that every single one of these three elements, present cardiology does not treat at all. Not the endothelial cell, not the endothelial progenitor cell, and not the strength and viability of your HDL cholesterol. And yet, at the same time, every single one of those is powerfully treated when you are eating plant-based. So, now we have to talk a little bit about present-day cardiology. And again, let me be very clear. If I'm in the middle of a heart attack, I want a cardiologist next to me who has expertise in stents. That can be absolutely life-saving, all right? But what about the other 88% who are getting these stents, all right? Let's talk about that. How many, you know, we're so proud of this, these procedures because they can be done safely. Only 1% die, okay? So we do how many a year? 1.2 million in this country. How many die? 1.2 million in Medina. 1.2 million of 1% is 12,000. So 12,000 die with a stent. How many heart attacks when you're getting a stent? Not many, 4%. So how many, 1.2 million, 480, excuse me, 48,000, try again. <laughs> 48,000 heart attacks, right, while you're getting a stent. How many, when you're getting a bypass operation, what's the mortality? 3%. How many did we do? 500,000. So we have 15,000 die with getting the bypass. How many strokes? The same, 3%, 15,000 strokes. So let's just take that over a period of, say, 10 years. So we have 27,000 times 10, that's 270,000, a quarter of a million deaths with these procedures. All right. How many heart attacks? 480,000, half a million. And how many strokes? 150,000. If we happen to lose in Vietnam, or if we'd lost in Afghanistan, if we lose 12,000 GIs in a year, that would be absolute car carnage, right? So the question is, can we do better? I mean, right now, 40 years ago, the leading cause of death in America was cardiovascular disease. Now it's 40 years later. We've got all these drugs, all these procedures, all these operations. What's the leading cause of death? Cardiovascular disease. Now, what we do is we usually invent a pill, and the pill we invented was statins. And statins did help. This is a sort of a summary of the statin drugs when they were invented in the 1990s. They about 30% fewer heart attacks, 30% fewer heart attack deaths, 30% fewer stents and bypasses. But my question was, look, this isn't cancer. What about the other 70%? So, if we summarize how effective the statins are for what we call primary prevention, let's say somebody, nobody's ever had a heart attack, they don't have, to their knowledge and the doctor's knowledge, they don't have uh, heart disease, but they just say, your cholesterol is a little high, we're going to put you on statins. What's the benefit from that? If you summarize all those studies, as it was done last June, there is no benefit. It does begin to kick in when you've already had a diagnosis of heart disease. All right. Now this is, <laughs> you get a break for a minute. <laughs> this is an industry that's a little out of control. It's called the dairy industry, all right? Okay. So this is Walter Willett from Harvard, who is the chairman of their public health department. And this is his summary a year or two ago of the present situation. The current path leads to increasing adiposity, diabetes mellitus, cardiovascular disease, and a disability and an unfit, socially isolated population stuffed with pills and subjected to frequent palliative procedures. Well, this, on the other hand, 
uh, is the New York Times. And this is the surgeon who operated on Bill Clinton explaining what happened to him when his graft shut down and he ended up back in the hospital in February of 2010 to have to have some stents. And he said, this is not the result of his lifestyle or diet. This is a chronic condition. We don't have a cure for this. And this kind of disease is progressive. There truly aren't any cures. That's Clyde Lancy, who was the chairman, excuse me, the president of the American Heart Association. Gentlemen, I strongly, 100% disagree. So I want to share with you now <clears throat> a couple of studies that I did. First, while I was uh, still uh, involved as a surgeon, and I didn't have a great deal of time, I started a small pilot study in 1985. And I went to our Department of Cardiology and said, look, I'd like to see if I could take some of these patients who are quite ill with heart disease and see if we can't uh, get them to change and eat a plant-based diet, and maybe we can halt the progression of this disease. And over the next uh, about year and a half, I eventually got these 24 uh, patients. And the, uh, there was no bias that I had against women. It was just the way the patients came at that time. In the next study, I'll show you after this, we have plenty of women. Now, these patients, when they came, they had failed their first or second bypass. They had failed their first or second angioplasty. They were too sick for these procedures, or they had refused. And there were five who were told by their expert cardiologist that they wouldn't last out the year. But I'm happy to say all five of those went well beyond 20 years, and everybody who was compliant uh, turned it around. And it was very exciting to know that I was se severely challenged by the fact that I was so concerned about compliance because I was not a behavioral psychologist. I was not a cardiologist. I was a general surgeon with this idea or this concept. And so to achieve their compliance, I decided I would use the same mantra that I had used for my cancer patients, which I had learned many years ago from a wonderful surgeon from the West Coast named Bert Dunphy. And Bert used to say that patients with cancer are not afraid to die. Patients with cancer are not afraid to suffer. But patients with cancer are afraid of being abandoned by their family or by their physician. And so the first five years, I saw every one of these patients every two weeks in the office, got their blood pressure, their pulse, we took their uh, weight. We also checked their uh, cholesterol. And I did this for five years. At the end of five years, I was very bold, and I stretched it out to every four weeks. We really got to know each other pretty, <laughs> pretty well. And then at the end of a decade, we did it quarterly because by this time, they were so familiar with it, they were on autopilot. Now, what I want to share with you next are because of the brachial artery tourniquet test, I've told you we now know what are the foods that every time they pass your lips, you injure, you imperil, and you compromise the capacity of your endothelial cell, you injure your HDL cholesterol, and you disfavor your endothelial progenitor cell. What are the foods that do that? Any oil. Pure virgin, olive oil, corn oil, soybean oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, coconut oil, canola oil, palm oil, injures endothelial cells. Fish, fowl, and meat, anything with a mother, anything with a face, injures your endothelium. Dairy, yes, even caffeine. And what is not up there, and as we now know, is very powerful for injury is something like orange juice, apple juice, agave juice, honey, maple syrup. Why? Because of the fructose. Glucose we all have to have. That's how we thrive. But we can get that. Our liver knows how to make that. But if we start stuffing ourselves with fructose, fructose is a toxin. That's why I'm so anti-smoothie. Because when you take an apple, you take an orange, you take a banana, wind it all up, <laughs> Now you've separated the sugar from the fiber. You eat that as a fruit, fine. You grind it up in the, throw it past the very most important part 
of your digestive system when you start out, which is your chewing and your saliva, valuable. So it goes past all that, clunk into your stomach with that load of sugar, boop, up goes the insulin, and now we have the problems. The leading cause of non-alcoholic liver disease, cirrhosis of the liver, fructose. Oh, now, okay, that's exciting. Somebody in the audience is saying, oh, I can't believe that about oil. All right, here's what happened. This is a study that came out after my book, another one, on oil. Let's read it together. Olive, soybean, and palm oil intake have a similar acute detrimental effect over the endothelial function in healthy young subjects. That is a peer-reviewed scientific article. Yes. All right, what are you going to eat? All those marvelous whole grains, W-H-O-L-E, whole grains for your cereal bread and pasta. All right, 101 different types of legumes or beans. All those marvelous red, yellow, and green leafy vegetables. And some fruit, all right? Now when you get, for instance, in our book, when we started this in 1984, <laughs> it was pretty hard to find recipes like this, but our book, and there are many others now that have plant-based recipes, and they can be absolutely so exciting, uh, like a, a meal that we had uh, this evening. All right. Now, I've mentioned that when you stop these things, <clears throat> you're taking gasoline out of the fire. You're stopping the inflammation. But if I've got somebody who already has heart disease, the reason that I succeed where others fail is because nobody's quite the taskmaster that I am. I'm not as mean as I look, <laughs> but I hate failure, and I hate failure in my patients. And so we want to be winners. So in addition to taking the gasoline out of the fire, I want water on the fire. What gives water on the fire? Green leafy vegetables. Yeah, but I don't want just a few drops at dinner time. I want it all day long. I want to drench that fire. So how do we do this? You have green leafy vegetables alongside the oats for breakfast. Mid-morning snack, green leafy vegetables with your lunch and sandwich. Of course, mid-afternoon and obviously at dinner time. And I adore it when you have that evening snack of kale. <laughs> now, you're laughing. Good. <laughs> But it, I tell you, when you, Ann will show you how to <laughs> strip the kale, put it in some hot water, five, five and a half minutes, we like it soft, and dial up on Google the olive tap. And you will find the most wonderful array of balsamic vinegars. Put a little on that kale and you'd swear what you were eating was a hot fudge sundae. <laughs> All right. What are the green leafy vegetables that you're going to have to eat? Bok choy, Swiss chard, kale, collards, collard green, beet greens, mustard green, turnip greens, napa cabbage, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cauliflower, cilantro, parsley, spinach, and arugula, and asparagus, and I'm out of breath. But that's a start. <laughs> no oil. All right, this group started with the cholesterol was high, 237, and over the next 12 years, they kept it, as you see here, the total kept it under 150, and here they are. Their good cholesterol, HDL, was lower than the American normal, which is 40 for men. They kept their LDL right around 80, which is great. And what I'm going to show you next is exciting to me always because there was a, some of this group, we repeated their angiograms. There were medical indications, and they were very anxious to see what was happening. These angiograms were, re, were looked at in triplicate three times in the Cleveland Clinic Angiography Core Laboratory, where they were reviewed by senior medical technicians who do this all the time for national trials. So when I give you a certain percent of improve, improvement, I know that it's accurate. This is as small an improvement as you can see with the naked eye. This is actually... 10% uh, improvement in a 67-year-old uh, 
retired pediatrician. This is what we call <clears throat> the left anterior descending coronary artery. It is wider here by 10%, a little easier to see. Don't worry about the date. The date isn't when, how long it took for this to happen. That's how long it took me to raise the money to get these angiograms. Here is uh, the 58-year-old factory worker. This is the circumflex artery that goes to the back of the heart. And this was described as a 20% improvement from here uh, over to here. On the other hand, this is a retired security guard with a right coronary artery. And this was described as a 30% improvement from here to here. <clears throat> this <clears throat> angiogram that you're seeing here now is of a young 44-year-old surgeon at the Cleveland Clinic who replaced me as chairman of the Breast Cancer Task Force. And at age 44, Joe began to get chest pain. No family history, cholesterol 156, was not, did not have high blood pressure, he was not diabetic, he was not a smoker, but began getting this chest pain. Cardiology worked him up in October of 1996 and found nothing. So three weeks later in November, he was finishing his surgical schedule. He sat down to write post-op orders, splitting headache. Immediately thereafter, he felt this crushing Elephant sitting on his chest, pain in his jaw, shoulder down his arm. Joe was having a heart attack. He was whipped down to the cath lab. Start the cath, cardiac arrest, resuscitate. Finish the catheterization, another cardiac arrest, resuscitate. Then he stabilized up to his room. Three days later, he was discharged, but very depressed. He was depressed because what they found on his angiogram was that the entire lower one-third of his left anterior descending coronary artery, which goes to the front of the heart, was all moth-eaten and diseased over too long a segment to permit any stents to be administered, and it was too far down the artery to qualify for bypass. So he was very depressed that nothing could be done, so Ann and I had him out to the house with his wife uh, two weeks after his heart attack. Look, Joe, come on. You've been eating this horrible Western American diet. You've got the typical disease. Why don't you think about going plant-based? We've got 10 years of data. Oh, okay, he said, S, I think I will give it a shot. They couldn't offer me anything else, but I'm not taking any of those statin drugs. I don't trust them. Okay, that's your call. Not a problem. He became the absolute personification of commitment to plant-based nutrition. And over the next 30 months, total cholesterol went from 86, 156 down to 89. He was like a rural Chinese. His bad cholesterol went from 98 to 38. And then he had another angiogram. And up in the surgical office area, my office is three doors apart, and at noontime, on the day that I know earlier that morning Joe had had his follow-up, angiogram. I uh, found myself going over to his office, let myself in. There's Joe behind his desk. Joe, I understand you had the old follow-up angiogram earlier this morning. Yep. Uh, mind sharing with me? How did it go? He got up around his desk, came up to me. He said, I think we're doing pretty well. And I said, well, great. Uh, any chance that I could see <laughs> the follow-up angiogram? He said, yeah. So it is, how are you going to do this with a bypass or a stent? The body has this incredible capacity, power, to want to recover if you know what to do and you give it a chance. And the people that are always most compliant, get always the best results. Why would any, when you think about it, when you think about it, there are only three reasons why you go out for dinner. One, 
You don't have to do the dishes. Right? Two, the ambiance. Oh, this is a lovely. Three, the companionship. But you never go out to a restaurant to further destroy your endothelial cells. Right? Good, we got that. <laughs> Now, despite my sparkling personality, <laughs> six of these original 24 nice guys just didn't quite get it. And I had no money. So I, within six months, I said, look, I understand, guys. I'm going to release you back full time to your expert cardiologist. And so I looked in from time to time. At the end of 12 years, those six guys, two had died and four had had to have another bypass. On the other hand, when we looked at the 18 who stayed with us on that small original program, we wanted to know how many cardiac events they had had in the eight years prior to coming on our program while they were in the hands of expert cardiologists. And we found that there were 49 events that you can see listed up here of the increasing disease, angina, disease progression on angiogram, bypasses, heart attacks, strokes, or worsening stress tests. However, once they came on the program, for 12 years, 17 of those 18 had no further cardiac events. We had uh, one little sheep who wandered from the flock. At the end of six years, got into the lamb chops, the milkshakes, the pizza, the glazed donuts, got the angina, got the bypass, now he's back with the flock, but he proves the point that I'm trying to make this evening. All right. So let's compare this to what we saw earlier with conventional cardiology. There's no mortality from the diet. There's no morbidity from the diet. You don't get sick. There's no really added expense. Do you know what the expense is presently of cardiology? Just to take an example. One of the entitlements that is pulling this nation into debtor's prison faster than anything else is Medicare. What is 45% of Medicare? Cardiology. And what does that mean? That means that all that money is being on, spent on drugs and imaging and stents and bypasses, none of which are treating the causation of the illness. So often patients with heart disease will have their first stent Ah, second stent. Ah, third stent. Maybe throw in a bypass. Some more stents. Progressive disability. Congestive heart failure. And then these people die of a completely benign disease that has never been treated in terms of its causation. I think we in America can do better than that. So, all that happens with the passage of time when you're eating this way is that the benefits continue to improve. And there's nothing that a patient who's had a previous heart attack fears more because they are at risk more than anyone else for having a second heart attack. Nonsense. When you eat, it's so empowering for them to know that when they eat in a way that they strengthen the cap over their plaque so that they cannot rupture that cap over the plaque. They have made themselves heart attack proof. Okay. Now, Let's just briefly look at this new group that we're just in the process of, of working up for publication in the scientific literature. 226 patients, tw uh, 30 of those were for, simply for prevention, the other 196 had heart disease. And here are the results of those who were, uh, those 176 who were compliant, that's 91% who were stuck with it. Now let's compare this to other cardiovascular studies that are out there. These are three other cardiovascular studies. This is the percent after four years of a, what we call a major cardiac event, either death, heart disease, or stroke. The usual is about 20%. We found that with ours, it's been a half of 1%. That's a 40-fold difference when you start treating the cause of the disease. What happened to that one patient? He didn't die, didn't have a heart attack. He had a stroke. He had a tendency to hypertension. And when he went to China, he said, well, I don't see Dr. Esselstyn around here anywhere. 
think I'll eat off the economy for a while. If you're eating in Beijing or Shanghai and the economy, you're just, you might as well just take spoonfuls of salt. His blood pressure went through the roof and he had a little brain fart, a uh, stem cell brain fart, did fine. But uh, literally, you can literally make this disease vanish. I don't care what your genes are. I don't care if all your uncles or your father had heart disease. They all ate the horrible same diet. How could they possibly get heart disease if they're eating kale? <laughs> all right. Now, we've talked about the heart. We've got a few minutes left. I want to talk about the brain. What's the good of having a strong, healthy heart if your brain is getting a little wobbly? We know that by the time we're 85, in Sweden or in this country, 50% of Americans have dementia. And that is really problematic. What can we do about dementia? We got tremendous insight into this from the work of Megan Leary and her team from the West Coast, who in 2001, reporting in, Mi in Miami at the stroke meetings, presented the data on over 5,500 MRIs of the brain that they had done. And this is a normal one that you see up here. Nice and uniformly dark. The white that you see here are the cerebral ventricles. Now, what they begin finding is that at age 50 in Americans on the MRI, they begin to see these tiny little white spots. Well, what are these tiny little white spots? Little strokes. You're playing tennis, you're sleeping, driving a car. Zeppo, a little stroke. Not a problem. Big brain, tiny stroke. But now you're 65. You've had another 15 years of the good old Western diet. And now, more often than before, you find yourself saying, sweetheart, where did I leave the car keys? Well, you know, you work your way through that. But now you do another 10 years of it, the good old Western diet. Now you're 75. Sweetheart, where did I leave the car? So you kind of sit down, talk it over, get through that. Now you're 85. And you look at her and you say, are you my sweetheart? <laughs> I can't change that. I can't reverse that. You're either working toward that now or you're not. So you can start tonight when you get home or tomorrow, you know, whip up those greens. <laughs> because look at this. I counted 90. 90 of these little strokes. How in the world can a message get through a neuron if you get hitting scar every time you turn? But wouldn't you love to do MRIs on the brain of all of our Supreme Court justices? <laughs> kind of an intriguing thought. We've talked about the brain. We've talked about the heart. What about the leg? Well, we know information about that. One of the patients when I first started this, in walking across the skyway to my office had to stop five times because of pain in his calf muscle because he had a partially blocked artery in his thigh. So when I first heard this, I sent him immediately over to the vascular lab. And here is his pulse volume right here that you see this nice little amplitude. I was so worried about his heart, I forgot all about his leg. Eight and a half months after into treatment, he said, Dr. Esselstyn, remember when I first started seeing you, I had to stop five times crossing that skyway to your office. He said, the last month, it got to be four times. Then it was three, then it was two, one. He said, I don't stop anymore. All right, back you go to the vascular lab. Now you can see the amplitude of this pulse is almost double what it had been before. You know why this was so terribly exciting? because this was just after we sort of had started our study. And in science, <laughs> this was what we call proof of concept. Our hope was that we could slow the progression of the disease. This guy showed us that we could reverse the disease. And, and if you look at the date, 1986, that was before any statin drugs were invented. That is the power of nutrition. So here tonight, the, mo the two most powerful examples I've shown you. This one reversed it in his leg. The other one who reversed it in his heart 
who was a surgeon at the Cleveland Clinic, no statin. Okay? So if you are somebody who, when you try to take statins, find that you can't get up off all fours because it gives you so much muscle ache and what have you and you don't want to take it, the other option is to just do it right. All right. Now, here's another one. This was a chemistry, high school's chemistry teacher who uh, was 78 years of age. And in his retirement, he and his wife, they adored fast square dancing, you know. And <laughs> what happened was both calves began cramping only during the fast square dances. So we saw a cardiac surgeon, and they did this image, and it shows you can see how absolutely calcified. This is the main aorta going to the back of the abdomen, going to the right and left leg. And uh, obviously, it's pretty diseased. So somehow, he didn't want to have this $60,000 operation. And he went to the internet, and he, somehow he found me, and we got together. And he said, well, Dr. Esselstyn, if I do your program, how long will it take to get better? I said, probably about eight and a half months. Three months later, he called me and said, Dr. Esselstyn, you do not speak the truth. OK? The pain is now gone. OK. I keep learning. Anyway, so exciting to think, didn't have to have that big operation and all the side effects, just good old plant-based nutrition. Now, as we wind it up here, we have to have a message for the boys and the ladies. But all of you, when you're watching sports programs, not always sports programs, sometimes mystery dramas, you'll hear a phrase that'll ring out through your ears that'll sound like, when the moment is right, will you be ready? Uh, I don't think it's a great secret that the, the penile arteries are actually smaller than the coronary arteries that go to the heart. So it's not infrequent that before somebody has a diagnosis made of coronary artery heart disease, they may find that they're no longer able to raise the flag. So all is not lost because not infrequently, eight or nine months after I've counseled somebody, I'll get a phone call. Dr. Esselstyn, yeah. This is Mr. So-and-so. Oh, sure, yeah. How's it going? Well, I, he said, I wanted to talk with you. You know, uh, there's something that's come up that... Uh, <laughs> that we didn't talk a, a lot about, but I'm wondering if I don't owe you another check. <laughs> now, how soon... When I said, you can make yourself heart attack proof in three weeks, how can I say that? This is a PET rubidium dipyridamol scan of the heart. And what you're looking at is a red cell that has been labeled so that we want the blood to get uniformly throughout the heart. Well, here is this Youngstown, Ohio school bus driver who's 58 years old with a test cholesterol 261. He comes in, and here he is. He's good. If it's yellow or if it's orange, you're okay. But right in the middle of the heart, all green, poorly supplied with blood. I counseled him an hour after he had this done. And 10 days later, his cholesterol is down to 126. Six weeks later, we repeat it. Whoop! He's got it all back. What's going on here? Here's another one. This is a downtown Cleveland stockbroker, 60-year-old, 248 cholesterol. In this view, you're supposed to look like a donut cut in half. And... <clears throat> He's doing all right here and here, but all this green here, not good, not perfusing well. I counseled him an hour after he had this. Ten days later, his cholesterol down to 137. Three weeks later, he's got it back. What's going on? When you do this so profoundly, and you, you don't wash out the blockage or the plaque that fast, but what you do is you reestablish the vitality of the endothelial cells so that they raise up this level of nitric oxide, right? And as you raise up the level of nitric oxide, that is the strongest dilator of blood vessels in the body. 
So as the level of nitric oxide goes up, those non-diseased, still normal vessels in the heart begin to dilate, as well as the diseased vessels begin to dilate. And if you recall, in physics, Poisset's law of flow through the hollow viscous is related to the fourth power of the radius, meaning that a tiny increase in diameter, a huge increase in flow, which is why they often get rid of their chest pain or their angina within weeks of starting this, or it's markedly diminished. Now, here's where I sort of share the dream with Pat uh, Baraducci, because he has a vision for this community to be the, the healthiest community on the planet. And it's not going to be done with pills. It's not going to be done with procedures. It's not going to be done with operations. But it is totally lifestyle. And what I'm going to share with you right now, I'm going to make the argument that we really don't have one, we don't really have multiple major common chronic killing diseases. We have one, but it has multiple manifestations. Let me give you an example. Let's suppose that I start all right, counseling somebody who had a heart attack and he or she weighs 245 pounds. They're obese, they've got high blood pressure, they are diabetic, and they've had this heart attack. All right? But they get it. They just get it. Poop. Year, year and a half later, 155, 165, no longer obese, no longer diabetic, no longer high blood pressure, no longer at risk for a stroke, no longer at risk for a heart attack unlikely to have diverticulitis, unlikely to have osteoporosis, or lupus, or rheumatoid, or MS. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. We've seen allergies and asthma and joint discomfort. Can't change osteoarthritis, where you've worn off your articular cartilage, but it is so ha profound what can happen when you make these lifestyle changes. And most importantly, when you get to be senior, we're not gonna live forever, we're all gonna die. Look at Jack. Lalanne, I mean, he was a, remember, he was the great guy on TV in the 40s and 50s and who was always working out. He was a wonderfully uh, fit man right up until 95. How did he die? Died very quickly. He died of pneumonia after he had surgery because he had to have a heart valve that had to be replaced. But the example that I want to show you here is Dave Schumann is a physician from Worcester, Ohio, and he's a great fan of mine, and I think he's wonderful. He gave me this slide of one of his patients who was, this man was diabetic, and I think what you can see here, he finally got him to go to plant-based nutrition, and immediately his blood sugars started coming down, coming down, and he saw me the other day, and I, he said, I gotta give you a new slide. He said, the guy no longer has any diabetes. So that's how powerful and exciting it can be. This is another of his patients, this is a woman who has osteoporosis. Her bones are getting soft and weak. Why? Because she is peeing away her bones. Her calcium, of urinary calcium level is way up here. Should be down here in the blue. He persuades her finally to go plant-based and immediately her urinary calcium comes back to normal. No longer pouring away the calcium. Now, <laughs> I didn't know if I should show this or not. You all wanted to know what Pat Baraducci looked like when he was 20 years old? <laughs> but this is another great Italian. This is Joe Rossellino. Joe was a uh, 1921, a world famous strongman in Coney Island. All right? 635 pounds with one finger. Put a spike in his teeth, <laughs> bend it. And he and his mom, he lived in Brooklyn, and he and his mom were totally plant-based. And the exciting thing is that here he is without eyeglasses, without a cane, with all his teeth, and without a hearing aid at 103. And at his 103rd birthday, he put a spike in his teeth. So, 
you know, you don't, you, you don't have to bend spikes to be 103, but <laughs> I think he's a marvelous example of people who say to me always, Dr. Esselstyn, how can I get protein and be strong? What? There are world-class athletes who are professional football players who are plant-based. They are world-class athletes who are mixed martial arts champion wrestlers who are plant-based. Uh, it's just many in track and field because they recognize that if you really want to make those muscles work and work well, you've got to have the endothelial cells being absolutely optimal. All right? And for many years, I worked on the eighth floor of this uh, building. And I think you can see from the uh, trees that this shot in Cleveland was during February. <laughs> uh, however, uh, now that I've graduated from being a surgeon to preventive medicine, while the, the budget is a little bit more modest, but the morale is quite high in preventive <laughs> And <clears throat> if I've learned anything over the last uh, 50 years in medicine, yep, brains are important, but more important than anything is persistence. Persistence. Best exemplified by this young damsel, 1939, Life magazine, trying to learn how to do the splits. It is hard to do the splits, but she stuck with it, she stuck with it, she stuck with it. And the other day, downtown Medina, Pat Baraducci spotted her, she got it right, and he sent me the slide. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, uh, I would like to say, I think that you, well, first of all, thank you. And I'd like to say that it's one thing to hear uh, what I have to say about this, but uh, there are two things that are going to follow me. One, because he's promised not to spend more than about six minutes, because I know it's tight on your schedule. But before we, he, right now you're sitting there a little bit like a puppy in the deep grass. Gosh, Dr. Esselstyn has told us all about this and how and what. But plant-based nutrition, how do I do that? That's why you're going to learn from the woman who knows more about this than any but think shortly. 27 years experience with plant-based nutrition, how to acquire these foods, how to prepare them, get over the stumbling block. But right now, I think you ought to hear from somebody who has a very interesting story.